Right, hi everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Julian. I am from New Zealand. I'm living in uh, in, in Berlin, in um, in Deutschland. Um, I'm from New Zealand. This is not an Australian accent you're hearing. That's that's really important. And I think if you understand that it's not an Australian accent, then I think this uh, this talk I'm about to give will be a huge success, both for me <laughs> and my family. Um, it's it's also important to uh, to emphasise that New Zealand and Australia are actually separate countries, um, that there is actually space, <laughs> it sounds, sounds wild, there's space in between Australia and New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand is so far away from Australia that if you try to swim from the very bottom of Australia, say Melbourne, um, all the way to, uh, to, the, to the North Island of, uh, of New Zealand, say Auckland, you'd be so tired when you arrived that you could not fight the giant flightless birds with your fists, let alone survive the hordes of rugby-playing cannibals. <laughs> so I'll just, uh, I wish the rest of my talk was going to be quite that silly, but it's not. Um, anyway, um, I had, um, well, I've been asked to come here to talk about uh, augmented uh, reality, which is which is a, a sort of a difficult term. I mean, as, the, um, as the, 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 uh, the man that introduced me said, it's a technology that provides add-ons for the real. That all, that all sounds quite ambiguous. Let's just say that augmented reality, as it's commonly understood, is any technologically mediated um, manipulation or modification of reality as it's experienced. Typically, that's done with something like a, like a phone. One holds one's phone up in, uh, in, in camera mode and, uh, and one sees another layer over that reality as mediated by the phone that ideally is useful. However, I do think that uh, augmented reality as such has become somewhat of a, um, of a gold rush, um, especially in the, in the dot-com-like businesses that are, are really wanting to get in there first and, and make their mark. And this, I think, is something of a problem. Why is it something of a problem? Because it's one of these examples, yet again, of a, of a, te of a technology, of a tool, being mistaken for, for its purpose. I think it's always important to not mistake the tool for the purpose, and especially as an engineer and, and, and as an artist, this is of, 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 of great interest to me. The, um, the kinds of examples I'm talking about are uh, augmented reality for windshields in cars, now, certainly, that, that might work. Augmented reality in the supermarket, it could be useful, finding out where products really come from, et cetera, et cetera. Or, for instance, um, augmented reality in the zoo, I'm a hippopotamus. Oh, yes, you are, hippo. <laughs> or augmented reality in your breakfast, for instance, your porridge. Look, mum, my porridge has got, has got little elves in it playing cricket. Um, that's not necessarily a good example of, um, of augmented reality. Um, necessarily adding or en enriching one's uh, personal life. Well, maybe it would be fun to have elves in one's porridge. I'm not so sure. But um, I want to talk less about, um, about uh, augmented reality so much as uh, improved reality. And this is where I think really a technology like AR can, um, can, uh, can certainly have quite an application. The kind of reality that I'm interested in improving is, uh, is this reality, one that I'm sure you're all quite familiar with. The, uh, the, shall we say, the, the saturation, or if you want another spin on it, the infestation of billboard advertisements in our, in our daily life, in our daily urban life. Now, the, the, we're so used to these billboards, um, we're, we're so used to a scene like this in our cities, that we've almost come to accept that it's kind of a natural state, and I think that is certainly something to worry about. We're so, we're so used to living around these that we feel somewhat powerless as to how they change and when they change and, and, and why. We don't feel that we can negotiate with these images in any way. They simply change on our way to work one day. They're, they're, they're different on the way back. Um, we don't quite know who's necessarily in control of this process. Um, Howard Gossage, in a 1960s edition of uh, Harper's Magazine, said a very interesting thing. He said, nation states uh, take the uh, unintentional violation of their international airspace extraordinarily seriously, yet we, as, as members of the public, um, are intentionally violated by, by, uh, by billboards every, uh, every day of our lives. Now, um, <coughs> Zeit Magazine, a German newspaper, said that this is a, a new kind of dictatorship uh, that, that one cannot escape, and I think that's certainly a, a little true. 
Of course, some cities have managed to escape it. They've attempted to escape this. Um, here's a good example. This is uh, uh, Sao Paulo in, in Brazil. The image that we're looking at here is, is the very heart of the business and commercial district of uh, Sao Paulo, a city of uh, 20 million people. And it takes a little while, but if you do look at this image for long enough, you'll see that it's conspicuous, especially because there are simply no billboards right in the heart of the commercial district. So one is seeing the city in all its structural and architectural reality. And it's, it's quite an uncanny experience if you've ever, if you've ever been to a, a um, Sao Paulo or a city that has actually attempted to, to remove those billboards. Instead, we're actually left with these kind of telling remnants. Now, of course, um, billboards, the, rather, rather than, than some cities choosing to reject entirely billboard advertisements, um, they are, they're, they're more interested in looking at ways in which they can incorporate them into the identity of the city. And this is a good example. This is Times Square, New York. And it's almost like the, the people responsible for putting these billboards up, the very designers themselves, have actually um, kind of collaborated to produce a landmark um, in, an, in and of itself. So it's very easy to be black and white about uh, billboard advertisements. But uh, I think one does also need to remember that they do contribute to very much the identity of a city. In fact, this man said that Piccadilly Circus would just be a London roundabout without its signage. And <clears throat> he's in some ways right. If you imagine, uh, I don't know who of you here have been to uh, Tokyo, but if you go to Akihabara in uh, Tokyo, try and imagine that with it, without all its neon signs and animated billboards, it would certainly be, uh, be quite an unusual um, um, experience. We have forgotten a little, I think, that, um, that science, however, used to represent the products and services um, that were provided by the, by the building to which they were affixed. So at some point, those signs have been multiplied and they've become mobile, and now we're reminded of products and services, whether we seek them or not. So this begs the question, whose public space is it really? Is it really our public space as members of the public? What can we do about these billboards? Um, is, is, is there any way in which we can make this seemingly permanent, endless um, iteration of, of proprietary imagery in our public spaces our, and our exposure to them um, um, a, little bit more, a little bit more flexible, a little bit more negotiable? Um, a good example, for instance, is, is, uh, is buildings in Europe. If, if you live in an apartment in Europe, they're often protected by a kind of a, a heritage um, 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 trust such that one can't paint the balcony of, of your own apartment. Um, this is very unusual for me as a New Zealander. If you're, a, um, if you're in New Zealand, you're often living in a house, you can modify both the inside and the outside of your dwelling. You certainly can't do that in Europe. Yet when the exterior of an apartment is being uh, refurbished in Europe, it's often covered in scaffolding that is then rented out to a, um, an advertising agency. There's something a, a little ironic in, about that, I think. So I'd like to draw on the metaphor of, um, of, of readable and writable in the context of the services of our cities. A good example being um, in the computer science space, there's a term for read permissions and write permissions of a file. On a, uh, on a computer operating system, every file is either readable or writable or both. Now, normally, the system files on your computer aren't modifiable by um, the user of that computer. They're modifiable by the administrator. So we need to ask, who, for whom does the administrator of our cities allow right access to the services of our cities? Who do they allow to write? What parts of our public spaces are, are in fact, open for authorship? Let's just ask that uh, question here. The public space we can author includes ourselves, funny haircuts, big lapels, um, Bell bottoms. I was born in the 70s. Um, our front lawns, uh, if we have one. Um, you can have a tree shaped like a hippopotamus, and your neighbour will just uh, nod at you politely and then never say anything more. Um, you seem like such a lovely man. Um, our vehicles, you can spray paint your car, you can colour it pink, put big fluffy dice in the, in the window, get a funky number plate. But uh, really, the battle happens here. The battle is not on the surfaces of objects themselves, it's in the, it's in the surfaces in the, in the visual cortex. This is the real real estate that, that the marketeers and advertising, advertising agents are after, the visual cortex. This is where they want their mind share. So we can think about cognitive surface area here. Uh, we can think about a surface area in the mind that is in fact um, uh, targeted directly. 
Going back to this early image, we can do a simple experiment like this, just to see how much of the cognitive surface area is in fact um, occupied by proprietary imagery. A group in Vienna did this very, very nice uh, project where they simply made all the ad advertisements in a city yellow in order to uh, exemplify this fact. So let's take our, our, our fight, if you like, to the, um, to the visual cortex. Uh, back in 2008, I was playing around with, um, uh, with image tracking, uh, finding a way to teach a computer to recognize a unique image and then substitute that image with, uh, with any other content. I was very tired, but uh, I managed to get it working, so I was pretty psyched. Um, I look like such a Ted fanboy, but really this is actually a... Um, <laughs> It was just happened to be a video I had lying around. So this is just me playing some video on a postcard. I call this a video postcard. And can we move on beyond that? One more click. Yes, okay. So this is an example of what we call product replacement. Instead of product replacement, conspicuously drinking Budweiser in a film. Hey, Ted, I'll be out the back. Get the shotguns ready, you know. Budweiser, you know. Um, <laughs> I started to realize that, um, that I was onto something bigger. Advertising. The idea of, of, of taking advertising, intercepting those advertisements before they hit the visual cortex, and, um, and substituting them for art. So, an exhibition platform was evolved, the Advertiser. The Advertiser simply seeks to, to teach computers, from, sm from phones to, um, to, uh, to, 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 to desktop computers, to laptops, to recognize advertisements and substitute them for art. So, um, an artist can, for instance, um, uh, exhibit on Helmut Lang, Calvin Klein, Burger King, Yves Saint Laurent, wherever that advertisement is encountered in the city, whether it be on a, on a car, on a t-shirt, on a billboard, it will be substituted for their particular art. Now, this, um, in, in order to start with, we wanted to make a very, a very powerful um, uh, device capable of actually representing these ideas. And so I teamed up with a couple of Spanish people, Clara Boy and Diego Diaz, um, to develop a, a pair of binoculars. And I loaded a lot of software that I'd written and uh, that was significantly improved by a fellow Kiwi, Damien Stewart. You'll see that here in action. This is the billboard interception prototype. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that name. I'm really still a bit proud of it. Um, <clears throat> and here it is in action. This is in, a, um, in, a, in Transmediala 2010 in Berlin, a little video of it in action. Um, we had countless submissions from, uh, from people all around the world wanting to ad bust their, their, their favorite ads. This is, really, this is really, simply put, the basic idea of the advertiser in action. That woman used to be about 30 years younger in the original ad, of course. We didn't make these images. As I say, they were substituted, um, they were contributed by, uh, by other artists. So yeah, that's an example of the advertiser in action. Thanks. So I've got about a minute and 20 left. I'm just going to quickly go over the future of this project. We are currently targeting our Android and, uh, and, and iPhone um, phones um, such that we can really roll this out to the public on a, on a very large scale. Um, we're going to keep going with the binoculars, we're going to get them smaller, we're going to get them more robust, and that's really targeting museums that, for instance, might want to take what's inside the museums and just roll them out to the street. And uh, standalone uh, camera phones, just targeting 
the, the generic standard camera phone, one could, for instance, take an image of themselves in front of a billboard, send it to a server, and it comes back um, substituted with, uh, with art, any art of their choosing. So they're really the three different, um, shall we say, tiers of this, of this project and where it's going. In the interim and, uh, and throughout, it's entirely a free and open source software project. All the code will be published uh, very shortly. You're welcome as developers, any developers amongst you or friends of yours, to contribute to this project, to get on board, and, um, and let's take this project to as many cities as we can around the world, I'd like to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>